and gentlemen, Miss Victoria Wood. You don't have to shout hello back, it's not like Crossroads. You don't get any extra money for talking. Um, uh, uh, welcome to London Weekend Television. This is uh, lovely Studio One. This is the very studio where Michael Aspel interviewed Elizabeth Taylor. There's still a pool of nervous sweat by the back curtain. I don't know why she was so worried about meeting him. <laughs> It's not a bad studio, actually. I was thinking that this afternoon when I was hoovering it. <laughs> no, I had to. It was filthy. I complained. I said, there's no cleaner in these studios. They said, yes, it's that little man over there with a the little mop of grey hair. I said, well, that's very unhygienic. He should use a proper mop. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a horrible dressing room. I've got no curtains, just a festoon blind with a picture of Jimmy Greaves on it. <laughs> I'm used to this, though. I never get a nice dressing room wherever I go. I did the Royal Variety Show a couple of years ago. They put me in the same dressing room with Frank Carson, Stan Boardman, Bernard Manning and Angela Rippon. <laughs> and God, she knows some filthy jokes. I like... <laughs> and I did, I did the Edinburgh Festival, and they put me in the same dressing room as Rudolf Nureyev. But that was quite good, because they could sort of use his facilities, you know. I could watch his television and I had a lie down in his hammock. <laughs> I think it was his hammock. <laughs> These are my best clothes tonight. These are all specially made for me by the famous haute couturier, Maison René. Or René Mason, as we call her. <laughs> no, she's marvellous. She does it all herself. She's 103. She operates from a mobile home in a lay-by just outside Cleveland. She's, <laughs> she's colour-blind, unfortunately. <laughs> this was supposed to be red, but um, she can't tell red from blue. She once tottered into a brothel thinking it was a police station. <laughs> Oh, and I've had my hair done specially. Well, I had to have it cut last week, actually. I had a bit of a disaster with it. I decided to put henna on it at home. And I did what it said. I put all this henna on it at home, and I wrapped it in a hot tea towel, and I sat in the airing cupboard for four days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was the henna or the tea towel, but when I took it off, I had pure Irish linen written all on my head. <laughs> I've had quite an exciting journey to get to you. I flew here on the famous Manchester shuttle. It's rather an old aeroplane. I had to go next to the rear gunner. <laughs> The trouble is, you never get a proper movie, you know, because the flying time is so short. You just get one of the air hostesses flicking through the bunty very quickly. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same. I was thinking I should have come on the train, actually. I should have come into city. But whenever I go into city, I always seem to end up sitting opposite the woman who's eating the individual fruit pie by sucking the filling up through the hole. <laughs> right, the last time I went into city, I was sitting there like this, and there was a couple across the aisle having sex. But this being a British train, nobody said anything. <laughs> When they finished, they both lit up a cigarette, and this woman said, Excuse me, I think you'll find this is a non smoking compound. <laughs> now, I should explain um, there is supposed to be a celebrity audience here tonight, but um, so far, they're not here. <laughs> it's all right, we have heard from them. The bus has broken down on the M40. Um, they're all right. They're, we've heard Michael Jackson and Joan Collins are changing the wheel. <laughs> well, he's changing the wheel, she's holding the nuts. Um, <laughs> not done bad here tonight. Who have we got? Some friends of Wincy Willis and some people from Guildford. Well, that's not <laughs> They're all up there in the balcony, the people from Guildford. We don't show them because they're not famous. <laughs> you haven't even had a cup of tea, have you? No. Whereas the celebrities, what have they had? Some old volivons left over from Charles' play. <laughs> no, we've not done bad here. Who have we got? We've got some right honourables and at least one dame and a couple of old queens. <laughs> Yeah, round the back, getting the paint off my pack and mac but, um, <laughs> no, LWT, the company, oh, well, I say company, they've, um, they've said to me... No, they've said, because all these celebrities have flocked here this evening, I know that Maidenhead and Barnes are like ghost towns this evening. <laughs> um, because they're all here, they've asked me to involve them in the show in some way. Well, I've suggested the Beetle Drive. It's not gone down. <laughs> so the idea now is that they ask me questions, which I don't want to do. I'd rather ask them questions, wouldn't you? Yeah. I'd love to go up to Cagney and Lacey and say, why don't you get that washroom redecorated? <laughs> it wouldn't take Harvey more than a couple of days. <laughs> so I will, I will now take questions from the floor. I don't mind what they are. They can be, you know, 
serious, thought-provoking, intellectual as you like. Yes, lady with the split ends. Can I have your question? <laughs> have you got any five pences? Why? Well, I fancied a hot chocolate. <laughs> No, I haven't. I've left my Peggy purse at reception and... Uh, who are you anyway? Shouldn't you be up there with the people from Guildford? <laughs> oh, sorry, I recognise you now. I thought I got a whiff of nappy sand coming across. <laughs> yes, it's my friend here. Yes, Miss Julie Walters, star of Educating Rita, Typhoo One Cup. <laughs> uh... She only got that because Meryl Streep turned it down. <laughs> Oh, look, I know what. Let's have a question from someone dynamic and creative and a force to be reckoned with in television. Oh, no, let's skip that. Let's go straight on to Michael <laughs> Gray. <laughs> Michael. D do you really think there's any difference between men and women? The difference between men and women? I should think in your family there probably is, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> the men smoke the cigars and the women wipe out the ashtrays. I, <laughs> I think there's a difference. Yes, I think there is. I think physically there's a difference between men and women. I've never seen a man that looked good in a pinafore dress. I'm <laughs> Unless it was very, very plain with no bus darts. <laughs> <laughs> I think the real difference between men and women, I think, is that men, men are much more hopeless at Christmas shopping. I think that's my definition. I, but you see them all on Christmas Eve, don't you? Panicking, running in and out of department stores, blundering about like moths looking for the lingerie department. <laughs> Trying to buy French knickers for their wives without actually looking at them, touching them, or saying the word knickers. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken out, don't they? My really strong perfume for their wives because they think the wives will like it. And the wives don't like it, but they put it on because they think the men will like it. Then the men go around saying, Does that blue bottle come back then? What? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's have a question from someone who needs the exposure. Now, looking for pantomime this year, Celia? Celia Imri, can I have your question? Uh, yes. Are you an art lover? Am I an art lover? I should say I am. I love pictures. I love pictures that tell a story. What are they called? Comics. I love them. <laughs> well, I was just saying I was in Boots. I was, when I was in Boots, I was admiring their lovely oil paintings, of course, that they sell there. There were two on special offer. There was one of white horses running through the waves in the moonlight. That was <laughs> There was another one of white horses saying they wouldn't go in. It looked too cold. <laughs> Painters, I love Constable, Rembrandt, Picasso. Though he didn't crane inside the lines as well as Rembrandt. <laughs> Let me see, we've raised, we've raised the tone now. We've raised the discussion on a sort of intellectual and cerebral plane. So I would like to ask a question. Can I have a question from Joan Bakewell, a fine mind, a keen intellect? Could I have your question, please? Yes, I'd like to ask you a rather serious intellectual question, yes. if I may. Yes, you may. Do you think large bosoms are a handicap? <laughs> I just thought I couldn't manage a difficult question. <laughs> She's slumming it, really, tonight, Joan, isn't she here? Really? I suppose Mensa was shut, was it? Having <laughs> <laughs> a new billiard table put in, is that it? It's <laughs> a strange question. Do I think large bosoms are a handicap? I should say they were if you were a heavyweight boxer. Large bosoms. <laughs> well, they'd catch on the ropes, wouldn't they? Um, <laughs> I tell you what, there's not going to be any boxing soon on the television, or any wrestling. It's a man here is putting a stop to it. We're going to have more upmarket things on the television, like needle work and dressmaking. <laughs> Won't be the same though, will it, of a Saturday afternoon watching some big fat hairy man squatting over an embroidery frame. <laughs> <laughs> but my bosoms, well they're not so much a handicap, it's more of a disappointment really mine when I got them. No, because I wanted Meccano and I got these. <laughs> <laughs> but they're a terrible thing to just get, you know, like I was in a class of about 35 girls and suddenly every night, everyone, overnight, everybody had enormous bosoms and spots and really greasy hair. <laughs> like if we went swimming in the sea without caps on, they had to hose the seagulls down with fairy <laughs> <little. laughs> And suddenly, I didn't know what anybody was talking about, because suddenly everybody was talking about periods, and I didn't know what they were. People were talking about periods the whole time. And then teachers would say, come and see me next period. I said, what? Because <laughs> the only thing I knew about them officially was that every so often the games mistress would come into the form room with a very red face, with her divided skirts wagging up and down like this. <laughs> She'd say, uh, girls, girls, uh, when you get your uh, period, um... Uh, don't come to me, go to the machine on the wall, uh, put your money in, get the packet out, and, and there you are. And she'd go, I didn't know what she meant. So when it happened, I went to the machine on the wall, put my money in, got the packet out, ate the chocolate raisins. And <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put weight on, I was doing that every month. Can you imagine that? <laughs> well, it didn't matter being huge, everybody in my class was enormous. They had to stop us doing cross country running because we dented a viaduct going on. The <laughs> So everybody was on a diet the whole time, and we thought that yoghurt made you thin, so we used to eat yoghurt all the time. And we used to say, Sandra, if you're going up to town, get some raspberry yoghurt. <laughs> then got raspberry, get somewhere else. <laughs> she used to come back and say, I can't get your raspberry yoghurt. Forgot your meat potato pie. <laughs> can, I, can I please have the question for Mr Dennis Norton, please? 
Yes. What do you think are the worst faults of the British? That's not one of my questions. <laughs> you pick that up off the floor. <laughs> I think the worst faults of the British is they're no good. No good at having fun, I would say. I, w I would class myself as a British, and I'm no good at having fun. I get overexcited if there's a pattern on my kitchen roll, you know. <laughs> <laughs> aren't we in this country when you think you know think what other races are like you know the Italians have got opera and the Spanish have got flamenco dancing what have we got Weight Watchers I mean it's only... <laughs> you know, when you think in India you know if a man dies the widow flings herself onto the funeral pyre I mean if a man dies in this country the woman just drags herself into the kitchen and says 72 baps Connie you slice I'll spread <laughs> Thing. The worst thing, the thing that drives me mad about British people is that they drive too slowly. I mean, I live in the country, a little windy road. I cannot go anywhere in the summer without getting stuck behind a mystery tour. <laughs> now, a mystery tour in this case being two old gits in a Morris Minor. <laughs> <laughs> why are they always in a Morris Minor? And why is it always brown? <laughs> why do they sit so low down in the seats? <laughs> so when you're behind them, all you can see is a little pork pie hat and a rain hood. <laughs> She's in the passenger seat, neither of them are driving. <laughs> She's navigating. She's trying to direct him up a crease on the map. <laughs> He's trying to get the top off the thermos. And they've got those stickers on the back window. We've seen the toilets at Longleat. <laughs> I lost my dentures at Alton Towers. <laughs> my other hat's a balaclava. <laughs> Twelve and a half miles an hour, because he had half a shandy three weeks ago, and he's going to get caught. And you know that any minute now, they're going to stop dead without warning or indicating or anything, because he only looks in his mirror to see if he's got his glasses on. <laughs> they're going to stop dead, and they're going to take out two picnic chairs and set them up by a pile of loose chippings at the side of the road. <laughs> and they're going to sit there for hours eating little bits of old potted meat sandwiches and old bits of Swiss roll out of different sized Tupperwares. And they're going to spend all afternoon fitting the different sized Tupperwares back into the boot. <laughs> something out of the Krypton factor. <laughs> I think this country's just essentially dreary. I mean, I was just in hospital, and when I came out, I thought I'd go on holiday, and I thought I'd go camping in this country, because I thought it would be healthy. And I'd heard that camping had got a lot better in the last 20 years. You know, they get nice tents now with landscape gardens and escalators and <laughs> granny flats and things like that. Because I went camping years ago with my boyfriend in this little green canvas thing that a scoutmaster had been arrested in in 1957. <laughs> and we we went away to sleep together, that was the whole point of going. And we always forgot that when the light was on inside the tent at night... <laughs> oh, well, you remember, I can never remember. Um, we were silhouetted through the canvas. People used to call out encouragement from the other tent. <laughs> Keep up a steady rhythm there. What the... <laughs> I should have known, because I'd been camping before with the guides a few years before that. That's another dreary thing, guides. I was in the worst guide patrol in the whole world, Sycamore Patrol. We had about three badges between us. And we went camping, and Captain said, for the first night's supper, we had to bring... Our patrol had to bring some vegetables and something that could be easily heated up. So we brought some potatoes and some Carmen Rollers. <laughs> so competitive this camping holiday with the guides there was a big competition for the most interesting thing to be found in the woods <laughs> I think another patrol won that with a rare breed of woodpecker I know we came nowhere with a man called Billy with all the buttons missing up his ring <laughs> Coming, I thought I'd go to the seaside. I'd go to a little British seaside resort, you know, to one of those little bed and breakfast hotels on the prom. You know, the sort with the single beds and the candlewick bedspreads with the bald bits where people have picked it off. <laughs> you know, there's nothing in the room. It's just a single bed and a pedal bin with a notice on it saying, this is not a B-day. <laughs> It's a hotel where everybody's very inhibited and everybody feels obliged to eat their breakfast in complete silence. So all you can hear is a sort of terrible gulping if you're trying to eat tin tomatoes quietly. <laughs> you know the sort of hotel, I mean, they're always called the Braemar or the Loch Lomond. Well, they are in England. God knows what they're called in Scotland. <laughs> the Stockport of the Manchester Ship Canal, I suppose. But they've always got these big notices outside boasting about what they've got. The Braemar, bed, breakfast and evening cocoa. Lift to all floors. That's a lie. That's not a lift. That's the thing that takes the plates down to the kitchen. <laughs> you could get one little old lady in if you folded her up. <laughs> Hold on very tight then, Mrs Armstrong. We're going down. <laughs> do at the seaside in this country. I mean, sometimes there's something amusing to look at on the beach, isn't it? Like a Punch and Judy or a man trying to put his underpants on under a guest towel. But <laughs> well, think people in this country, they don't like to do anything. They really like to park their cars on the prom and sit there looking out through the windscreen. 
Or sometimes they'll drive to a beauty spot and they'll park and they'll sit there looking out through the windscreen. And I think if you took people like that somewhere really exotic, you know, like the Taj Mahal, and they didn't have their cars with them, they'd say, well, it looks very nice. I think it'd look better with a tax disc and two windscreen. <laughs> Well, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you about this really exciting thing that happened to me last Thursday. And I was in the supermarket, and I'd only gone in for a loaf of bread, right? And I'm very strong-minded in the supermarket, you know, I just get what I've gone in for. I'm not swayed by the packaging or the lights or the music or any of that. So I'm standing at the checkout, and I'm just lifting out the folding greenhouse and the six rolls of wallpaper out of my trolley. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed this man looking at me, and I didn't take any notice at first, because sometimes people think they recognise me off the television. They think I'm that woman off Fresh Fields. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Julia McKenzie, the little fat one that lives next door. <laughs> or sometimes they think I'm French and Saunders. Well, not both of them, but they think I'm, they think I'm Dawn French. They come up to me in the street and say, what's it like being married to Lenny Henry? <laughs> I say, I don't know. I've only seen him on a muesli commercial. Why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't take too much note of this bloke staring, because there's a bit of a hoo-ha on my till, because the girl's being a bit heavy-handed running my cabbage over the infrared. <laughs> A lot of coleslaw, I don't want to pay. <laughs> so I'm packing up my shopping, having a bit of trouble with the deck chairs and the potting compost. And this bloke is stood next to me, packing up his shopping. I'm having a good look, because I love other people shopping. And I decide that he lives all on his own in a bed sitter, because he's got one of those little tins of baked beans and pork sausages. You know, where it's all in the one tin. It's the smallest size tin, it can only possibly have one pork sausage in there. <laughs> but the pork sausage is hanging over the edge of the tin, going, go on, the <laughs> Side, he lives in a bed sitter, but he shares a kitchen. I think he's a student because he's got one of those jars of freeze dried coffee and he's taking out the larger grains and initialing them. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the name of the coffee. It's one of those they advertise on the television. Um, it's the one where the woman goes into the kitchen and pretends to be a coffee percolator. I hate that one. <laughs> oh, I did. A friend of mine took that really seriously and she went into her kitchen and pretended to be a dishwasher, a tumble dryer, and an extractor. <laughs> They had to take her in an ambulance. And, uh, <laughs> she overheated herself. <laughs> anyway, so I'm pushing my shopping out to the car. I'm just trying to fit the ironing board in behind the back seats. <laughs> and he's still staring at me, this bloke. And he's actually not bad looking. He's wearing a pair of Levi 501s, you know, with the button fly and the little red tag. And he's covered in bruises, but he's obviously missed the point of the advert completely and got into the washing machine with them. <laughs> anyway, I finish with my shopping. I finish strapping the tumble dryer onto the roof rack. <laughs> I never got the bread. Oh, it doesn't matter. And, uh, <laughs> I think, well, because it's Thursday, I'll go and do a bit of late-night shopping, you see. So I'm walking along our high street, looking in all the shop windows, thinking, would that fit me? Why would it? It's a building society. <laughs> <laughs> and our high street is really boring. You know, it's got banks all down one side of the street and burger bars all down the other. And they're all identical, these burger bars. They've all got the same menu outside, like Quarter Pounder, that's everything. Slimmer's Burger, that's a burger and no bun. Vegetarian's burger, that's a bun and no burger. <laughs> Introvert's burger, that's just a serviette, but you don't like to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I go past the spud you like, and I see the bloke from the supermarket is sitting up in the window seat, looking out, tucking into his spud. I see that he's got the least interesting of all the fillings, mashed potato. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's looking at me, see, or just sort of staring out at the hustle and bustle of the passing scene. Yeah, that's a bit of an overstatement where I live. So I live in the dullest place on God's earth with the most stupid, thick people. I can't tell you where it is, because if they heard what I was saying about them, there would be an outcry. They'd go... <laughs> so I go past Spud you like. Is that how you say it? I don't know how you say it. Spudulike. <laughs> Anyway, that place. I go past there, and um, he picks up his shopping and he follows me out into the street. I think, well, this is a bit odd. So I go into Benetton, which is next door. I don't always spend any money in there, but I do like to go in and unfold things. <laughs> me into Benetton. I think, oh, blimey, he's a private detective. I'm being followed for a divorce case I know nothing about. But it could happen. No, because I once used to go out with a married man. We lived together as man and wife. No sex and a lot of arguments. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, just in case he is following me, I'll give him the slip. So I run out of the shop and I run across the road. It's a bit dangerous, just where the little man is flashing. I wish the police would move him on. I don't like to see it. <laughs> 
into our department store. Now, it's funny, whichever door you go into in a department store, it's always the leotard and handbag department. <laughs> Why do they put them together? <laughs> it's not like you ever bought a leotard and said, oh, now, let's get a handbag to go with. <laughs> I don't know why people buy leotards anyway. I think they're the most unflattering things. I think the only good thing to be said about leotards is that they're a very effective deterrent <laughs> against any sort of unwanted sexual attention. <laughs> so if you think, if you're wearing stretch knickers and stretch tights and a stretch like a leotard, well, you might as well try and sexually harass a trampoline. <laughs> it's almost worth letting them have a stab, I think. <laughs> Just to watch them boying off and bang into the hat. <laughs> into the leotard and handbag department. So I think, well, I'll give him the slip, so I nip sideways into the cosmetics department, where I think no man will really wish to follow me, especially because there's a woman on one of the makeup counters, you know, with a microphone announcing a makeup demonstration. She's looking for volunteers, and she's really, really overmade up, this woman. You know, she's got really, really thick false eyelashes. She's got to tip her head back to get her eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got the microphone, and she's drumming up a bit of trade like this. Welcome to the world of Sasha. <laughs> This is Madeleine speaking. <laughs> I'm over by the escalators between the health bar and the two pains. <laughs> Wendy and myself are just about to give a demonstration of Sasha Roll's new autumn range of cosmetics and skincare preparations. <laughs> so if any lady would care to step up to the Sasha Roll counter, that's right, by the escalators between the health bar and the two pains, Wendy will be very happy to give that lady a free makeup. And I must stress that it is free, totally free of charge, whichsoever. <laughs> of course, any lady or gentleman wishing to purchase from the new Sacherelle range, we have a special offer on special offer. <laughs> a free gift coming to you free with any purchase worth £36 or more. <laughs> free gift comprising of suede effect pochette. <laughs> To the drawstring with handy size odd months. <laughs> Total in mouth blot, eye wipe, and shimmer in cleavage and hand <laughs> So don't be bashful, ladies. All the Sacherelle sales assistants are fully qualified in all aspects of makeup and beauty therapy. On the top of which, Wendy comes to us with a diploma from the Geneva School of Sterilised Blackhead Popping. <laughs> Ladies requiring a special look, perhaps for an evening out. <laughs> or just for the sheer heck of it, then immerse yourselves in Wendy's capable hands and experience the true magic that is Sasha Rowell. <laughs> Well, news from Sacherelle is that colour-wise anything goes this season. Maroon is back with the right vengeance, eyes are popping out while lips are receding. <laughs> Powder shadows this season come in all shades of the speculum. <laughs> well, we've got all the time in the world here, ladies. We're just waiting for that one volunteer face to get that ball rolling. So course yourselves, please, over to the Sacherelle counter, where Wendy has been panting to get her mitts around somebody's chops since gone four. <laughs> Is it Wendy that's putting you off? I must admit, it's not the most hygienic boiler suit you've ever seen. <laughs> but she is doing an extra shift at the abattoir. <laughs> I will admit, Wendy does not have the Sacherelle beauty therapist diploma as of yet, but she does come hot foot to us with her city and gills in panel beating, bricklaying and cement work. <laughs> I must also stress, by the way, that it is medically almost unheard of for Wendy's eczema... <laughs> ..and Wendy's ringworm... <laughs> up at one and the same time in this way. So this is Madeline asking for the last time for one friggin' volunteer. <laughs> Will you drag your bums up, please? In the magical piggy world of Sasha Rell, where Wendy is slavering to dredge up your true inner beauty by smearing your gobs with overpriced bits of grease. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> All right, I didn't want to have to do this, but if nobody's going to come forward, I have no alternative. Wendy, take your muzzle off. <laughs> Fetch!
Well, she came towards me. I panicked. I ran into the shoe department. I must be getting old, you know. I passed the display of Dr. Scholl sandals. I thought, hmm, they look comfy. <laughs> the bloke from the supermarket is still following me. So I nip into the lift and let him get it up to the top floor, beds and pianos department. Seems to be all right. He doesn't seem to have followed me there. And I'm skulking around looking at all these hideous beds. Some of them have got mirrors over the top. I said to the assistant, what are they for? She said, well, they're supposed to make sex more interesting. I thought, I bet they don't. I bet all over the country women are just lying there going, your bald patch is getting bigger. <laughs> and then I hear piano music coming from somewhere. And I go towards the piano department. And there, seated at this little tiny white grand piano, is a big friend of mine, my very favourite cocktail pianist, Connie Mottershed. <laughs> the Oscar Peterson of Widness, we call her. <laughs> now, I know Connie really well because she plays and sings every night in our local cocktail bar, which is called the Manhattan. Now, this is Widness's first cocktail bar, and some people feel it's a bit lacking in atmosphere, you know, because before it was the Manhattan, it was the Widness Washeteria. <laughs> <laughs> They've not had it redecorated yet, but, but the best... You see, I like it. I like, you know, sitting up on a tumble dryer and sipping my tequila wash day. <laughs> That's tequila, orange juice and fabric conditioner. <laughs> but the best thing about it is, you see, that Connie... Connie plays and sings till about two o'clock in the morning. And it's nice, you know, if you've maybe had a couple of drinks too many, you're sitting up at the bar, you're thinking about somebody you loved and lost so many years before, and Connie's husky voice comes drifting through the smoke. Oh, I do like to be with that. <laughs> yeah, Connie, Connie's actually a very, very talented singer-songwriter. How can I describe her if you've never heard her? She's a sort of mixture of Barry Manilow, Suzanne Vega and Carly Simon. She's got a big nose, a headscarf, and she get a whole wagon wheel in her mouth without biting it in two. <laughs> She's been around, has Connie. She's been around. And her songs reflect that. It's one about Aberystwyth. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she's been in love. And she's been hurt. It's over. We've missed the bus. Nice idea. But not for us. We didn't click. Let's make it quick and say goodbye. Don't hold my hand and don't demand a reason why No loving looks, no fond regards Tonight was always on the cards I like big muscles, you were thin and lanky I like nice manners, you were far too cranky You blew your nose and then looked in your hanky <laughs> Things would never have worked The day I met you was a real heart-wrencher I thought that love would be a big adventure Then saw the spinach on your bottom denture <laughs> Things would never have worked I wanted champagne and oysters Cos that's the way I am You gave me Vimto, tinned carrots and Spam <laughs> Rapport's a thing you just can't manufacture you had your pin-up girl, I couldn't match her I didn't want to, it was Mrs. Thatcher <laughs> I wanted love to come and knock our blocks off But even Venus takes her card and clocks off Your idea of foreplay was to take your socks off <laughs> I wanted moonlight and roses And all that silly tosh You wanted gerbils Whip it, a wash. <laughs> I wanted love poems, but you couldn't write them. My earlobes nibbled, but you wouldn't bite them. You'd only fart and then attempt to light them. <laughs> <laughs> We're not compatible, let's not get blue, dear. At least we see each other's point of view, dear. Big hunky men, and so do you, dear. <laughs> right now, back to the story. Right. <laughs> I'm being pursued by this man from the supermarket, and I'm in the department store, standing by the piano, with this huge group of people. I see him coming towards me, so I create a diversion. I turn to a woman next to me with a facial hair problem. <laughs> I say, oh, Mr. Bellamy, we love your programmes. 
<laughs> and a huge rush for to rat and I escape down the back stairs. <laughs> Too late, he's there waiting for me and I just know he's going to kidnap me. I just know. And I don't know what to do about it, you see. I can't go to the police about it because I'm in trouble about my television licence. <laughs> no, they haven't got one. They came round with a detective van. They said, we've reason to believe you're watching the television. You're fine. Five hundred pounds. I said, it's only Gardner's World. They said, all right, four hundred and fifty. But... <laughs> I never paid it and I can't confront him, you see, face to face. I'm not that sort of person. I'm just not brave enough. I thought if only I was wearing a sanitary belt. <laughs> no, I didn't know what they were. I'd seen them in the department store. They said on the package, you will feel fully confident while wearing it. <laughs> so they, uh, I just have to make a run for it. So I run into the pub next door and I hide in a group of people around the dartboard. Now, I can't play darts, but I pretend I can. And it's my go and I don't do bad. I get a double one, an eleven, and a somebody's girlfriend. <laughs> and I was embarrassed and he was embarrassed because it wasn't until she started going like this. <laughs> realised he'd been going out with an inflatable woman. <laughs> well, we patched it up. Well, we patched her up first. She was on the floor. <laughs> I, I just had to make a run for it. So I'm running along the street. He's running along behind me. I think if I can just get to my car in the supermarket car park and I can't find my car keys. I must have dropped them. And I can't break into my own car because it's got an alarm system on it. It's American. It's the most sophisticated one you can get. Like, if you chuck a brick through the window, it doesn't go... Wah, 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 wah. He goes, why did you feel the need to do that? Maybe talk about it. <laughs> The street. He's ringing along behind me. Everything's shut by this time. I can just see one light down the end of the street. Just for once, our theatre, the Theatre Royal, is open. The light's streaming out into the pavement. It's buzzing with people. It's the opening night of something I've never heard of. A farce called, whoops, there go my bloomers. <laughs> I think we're only port in a stall, so I nip in. I get the last seat in the house. I go to the box office. You said it's £7.50 for the last seat in the stalls. Or for £2.50, you can have a bonquette. <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> I said, they don't know you anyway. Don't you? <laughs> so I go in, I'm sitting in the stores, ready for the opening night of Whoops, Leg and My Bloomers, and I can't see anything because I'm stuck behind this enormous woman. I can't see anything except her dandruff. So I put my 20 pence in the slot, get my little red binoculars out. Mm -mm, it's better, I can see a dandruff a lot better. Then. <laughs> so, but in the end, I got quite bold because I thought I'm not going to enjoy myself. So I tapped on the shoulder, I said, I'm sorry, so would you mind taking your hat off? She said, no, no, no. I still couldn't see anything. She had this huge jacket on with padded shoulders. So I tapped her on the shoulder, I said, sorry, would you mind taking your jacket off? No, no, no. I still couldn't see anything. I tapped her on the shoulder and said, I'm sorry, would you mind losing four stone? Because it's very difficult. <laughs> well, she's really cross. She whipped round. She said, I suppose you'd like to come and sit on my knee, would you? I said, well, I wouldn't actually, but don't think I'm running away from that side of my sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got her in front of me. I've got another woman behind me who appears to be munching through a roll of loft insulation, as far as I can. <laughs> Two of them, I may have missed them with the finer points of whoops, there go my bloomers. But I'll try and describe it. You see, I never go to the theatre, I never see fasters. You've probably seen a lot more fasters than I have. You've probably all been in them, haven't you? I don't know. <laughs> so I'll try and describe it. It seems to be the usual sort of thing. The curtain went up and there were some lights on and some people running about and shouting. And the audience is going, oh look, people running about and shouting. And um, then, <laughs> then they went off, those people, and some other people came on. In pyjamas, that's right. That was very funny, them having pyjamas on. People. <laughs> people were aching with laughter. At pyjamas. And um, <laughs> then they went off, those people, and some other people came on with a vicar. That's right, that was very, very amusing. <laughs> people were biting the back of the seat in front of them. <laughs> I thought there was a good bit where it all sort of stopped and I had an ice cream. And then it, it sort of started up again. And we reached what seemed to be the comic climax, as far as I could gather, of whoops, there go my bloomers. Is there were some people over there in pyjamas whispering. And there were some people over there with a vicar shouting. And there was a man in the middle who was neither in pyjamas nor a vicar, but even more hilarious. He was in long johns and he came from Yorkshire. <laughs> He'd been carried away in ambulances at this. <laughs> I'm fit for talking about too much laughing. Well, just as we reach this hilarious point of whoops, there go my bloomers, I see the bloke from the supermarket coming towards me along my row. Now, fortunately, it's taken me a long time to get to me, because people can't decide the best way of letting him by, you know. The full tipping up of the seat, the knees to the side, or the half crouch touching the quality <laughs> seat. So I've got plenty of time to nip out down my end of the road and I run down the aisle and I run for this big dorm up private, which is full of usherettes going, no, oh, it'll do another week. It's like... <laughs> and I'm trying to get out into the street. I take a wrong turning and end up in the middle of the stage, in the middle of, whoops, there go my bloomers. I say, I'm sorry, everybody, I'm sorry, I'm being kidnapped. Complete silence. Nothing from the audience, nothing from the people on the stage. I go off, I come back on again in a corset, holding a lavatory brush, say it again, huge round of applause. <laughs> He comes 
running onto the stage after me. I hop up onto the mantelpiece. He trips over a commode of two bishops and a haggis. <laughs> the buttons fly off his Levi 501s. His trousers drop, revealing a pair of novelty boxer shorts with a picture of Magnus Magnuson on the front. <laughs> he turns his back on the audience, reading the legend, I've started, so I'll finish. <laughs> he gets a standing ovation, and down comes the curtain. <laughs> well, I turn to him, after we've taken a few bows and bouquets and office of summer season at Bridlington. <laughs> and I say, have you been trying to kidnap me? And he said, no, I was trying to give you your car keys back. You dropped them in the car park at the supermarket. <laughs> I said, well, why didn't you say something? He said, well, I didn't like to. I thought you were famous. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you think I was? He said, I thought you were that woman off Fresh Fields. <laughs> I said, no, Judy McKenzie. He said, no, the little fat one that lives next door. <laughs> I said, no, I know who you are now. I said, good. I said, because of you, I've had to skulk round a department store. I've punctured an inflatable woman. I've just sat through the worst farts in the history of the British theatre. What have you got to say? He said, just one thing, Dawn. What's it like being married to Lena Henry? <laughs> my friend. <laughs> Kimberly. <laughs> Have you seen her? <laughs> She's got like dangly earrings with sausages on them. <laughs> when they're not in her ears. <laughs> No, she's really, really tall and just pierced up as high as he could reach her. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for her outside, but there were right big dogs sniffing up at me espid rules. <laughs> I don't know what sort of dog it was. It was really, really woolly. It's that sort that usually has four wheels and a handle. <laughs> we're having a day out, but we got separated. We said we'd meet up in here. We're having a great day out round town today. We've done the lot. Tried shoes on, had salad. <laughs> <laughs> it's our day off from the supermarket. You know, cheap save. We both work there. Kimberly chops meat. Like big bits. <laughs> we don't chop them, she just snaps them in two. <laughs> I'm on pricing. Like if, if Mrs Gupta on our till, she gets, say, a red cabbage unpriced. She goes, red cabbage, how much? <laughs> and I go, red cabbage, no idea. Back <laughs> to <Quite a> responsibility. <laughs> She's nice, Mrs. Gupta. She comes from, oh, where is it? It's got a really funny name. So that long way away, <gasps> Kidderminster. <laughs> I never thought there'd be so many people here, actually. But you can't miss Kimberly because she's really, really tall. She's usually got bits of ceiling stuck in her hair. <laughs> she's got a that interesting hairdo because we had it done this morning. Went to this really trendy salon. Kimberly had a spiral perm and a Mohican. <laughs> and I had my berry trimmed. <laughs> <laughs> then we went to this really great boutique. We tried loads of things on. But Kimberly's like really, really enormous. So she had to buy the only thing that fitted. <laughs> It's not everybody that suits a cubicle. <laughs> she hasn't got it on now, though. She's left it. She's having the doors taken up. <laughs> then we went to this really sophisticated French restaurant. There was a man playing the piano, just like Richard Clayderman, only quicker. <laughs> and the waiter was gorgeous. He said to Kimberly, ooh, you've got lovely dimples in your cheeks. Well, they're not dimples. The holes where she had to kebab sideways. <laughs> But I brought the menu all in French. Well, I don't know French. So I said, excuse me, what does this mean? He said, that's 10% service charge. <laughs> I said, I'll have that and some lettuce. <laughs> and I had a cocktail. Well, I had half a shandy with an umbrella in it. But Kimberly was really, really naughty. Because she had five pints. Five pints of sherry. <laughs> 
But we had to leave soon after that. <laughs> and I don't know why police women have to hold your elbows so tight. Look, <laughs> Kimberly well, was only playing the piano. You'd think they'd be right impressed anybody could play chopsticks with one nipple. <laughs> outside the town hall for a bit. Kimberly sat down on the town hall steps till they started to sag in the middle. She had to get up. <laughs> she said, do you want to come to the pictures? I said, well, I'm not going to a horror film. Because when Kimberly screams, you can see all her oovula. <laughs> <laughs> she usually got hot dog sticking to it. <laughs> and she wouldn't come to a comedy with me, because when I laugh, chips come down my nose. <laughs> <laughs> so we compromised. We went to see Mary Poppins 2. <laughs> the Revenge. <laughs> well, Kimberly insisted on sitting in the balcony, so that broke away from the wall. We had to go in the stalls. <laughs> then a man next to Kimberly put his hand on her knee. He was sorry, though, after. <laughs> when she ate it. <laughs> oh, she's really, really good with perverts, Kimberly. Like, if somebody flashes at me, I just run away. If they do it to Kimberly, she stops. She gives a marks out of ten for presentation. <laughs> Then she insisted on going in a cocktail bar and mixing up her own cocktail. Well, the first two ingredients were a galvanised bucket and some paraffin. <laughs> then she did some really interesting break dancing. It's not easy in an ambulance. <laughs> so I know, I left her in casualty. No, she's all right. I said, I'll come on here. She's all right. She's not badly hurt or anything, because she's very, very tough. She got run over by a car last week. The only thing that was damaged at all was the exhaust pipe. <laughs> so I said, I'll come on here and get in the queue. But we stood here ages now, haven't I? I'm not near the counter. You were all here before me, weren't you? <laughs> Have you had your burgers? <laughs> Have they? <laughs> this is not the wimpy. <laughs> Ooh, I wondered. <laughs> I wondered when I saw the piano. I thought, mm, it must have gone really, really upmarket. <laughs> Kimberly must be next door. So I'd die laughing when I tell her I've been stood here all this time in a bingo hall. <laughs> <laughs>
of a nuclear holocaust. Do you think there would be survivors or no survivors? <laughs> survivors, do you think there would be a total breakdown of society or some semblance of law and order? <laughs> <laughs> Just one more. Given some type of structured post-nuclear society, do you think people are more likely or less likely to be eating Hellman's mayonnaise? <laughs> to finish now with a romantic ballad. This is dedicated to my deep interest in the act of physical lovemaking. <laughs> it's very short. <laughs> it's the ballad of Barry and Frida. She felt sublime She switched off gardener's question time <laughs> Barry cringed in fear and dread As Frida grabbed his tie and said Let's do it, let's do it Do it while the mood is right I'm feeling appealing I've really got an appetite Desire, I could handle half the tenors in a male voice choir. <laughs> Let's do it tonight. But he said, I can't do it, I can't do it. I don't believe in too much sex. This fashion for passion turns us into nervous wrecks. No derision, my decision. I'd rather watch the spinners on the television. I can't do it, I can't do it tonight. So she said, Let's do it, let's do it. Do it till our hearts go boom. Go native, creative, living in the living room. This folly is jolly. Bend me over backwards on me hostess trolley. <laughs> Let's do it tonight. But he said, I can't do it. I can't do it. Me every breathing days have gone. I'm older, feel colder. It's other things that turn me on. I'm imploring, I'm boring. Let me read this catalogue on vinyl flooring. I can't do it. She said, let's do it, let's do it, have a crazy night of love. I'll strip a bear, I'll just wear stilettos and an oven glove. Dangle from the wardrobe in your ballet club. Let's do it, let's do it tonight. But he said, I can't do it, I can't do it. I know I don't want to get it wrong. Don't angle for me to dangle, my arms have never been that strong. Shouting, you know, pull the muscle when I did that ground. <laughs> I can't do it tonight. Let's do it, let's do it. Share a night of wild romance. Frenetic, poetic, this could be a last big chance. To quote Milton, to eat Stilton, to run and gay abandon on the tufted Wilton. Let's do it, let's do it tonight. I can't do it, I can't do it. I've got other little jobs on hand. Caught you even semi you Gymnastic, gymnastic, wear your baggy wife runs with a loose elastic. But... Let's do it tonight. I can't do it, I can't do it. I must refuse to get undressed. I feel silly, it's too chilly to go without me thermal best. Don't choose me, don't use me. Mother sent a note to say you must excuse me. I can't do it. Exempt you, want to tempt you, want to drive you mad with lust. No cautions, just contortions. Smear an avocado on me lower portion. <laughs>
the girl I'm mad about is Judith Chalmers. <laughs> Let's really make the rafters a rock. Be mighty, be flighty. Come and melt the buttons on me flame proof nighty. <laughs> 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 <laughs>